Genesis chapter 33 is where we are going to be. Mark talked about Jacob this morning and specifically Jacob wrestling with God and Jacob having his name changed, being identified by God differently than he had been. And what happened, the consequences of that, both good, mostly good, but also some of the challenging consequences that come throughout the whole story of Israel. And as we started a couple of weeks ago, this new series on Israel, I wanted to fall in line with that with you tonight. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 33. Let's bow and ask God to bless our time, and then we'll jump in and we'll study. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for every opportunity that we have to open the Word and to think about you, to think about your interaction with uh, people, whether it be people today or people thousands of years ago. So Father, we pray that you would bless our effort tonight. We pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have to say to us through this story. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. On October the 2nd, 2006, there was a shooting in an Amish community in Pennsylvania, the West Nickel Mines in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And five young girls were murdered on that day. There was a gentleman who walked into a church, into an Amish church, and opened fire and killed five little girls. In the statewide newspaper in Pennsylvania, there was a single headline a week later as they recounted the story, both of the shooting and then the aftermath of the shooting in 2006. And it was one word, single line, and it said, forgiveness. Because in that week period, the Amish community in Pennsylvania had such a radical attitude of forgiveness that even the state-run newspaper couldn't help but recognize what was going on. What does it mean to forgive? What did it mean for the people from the Amish community to go to the wife of the killer and tell her, at her home, that they would not only forgive her husband, but they would continue to pray for him and try to support him the best that they could. Now, how does a believer balance justice in very, very difficult circumstances when justice is the right thing? How do we balance justice and forgiveness? In other words, when we've been legitimately wrong. How do we forgive? Every one of us, I think, needs to be reminded of what the Bible says. And as Mark had laid out this morning and as he shared earlier with me this week, what he intended to do this morning, I couldn't help but be drawn to Genesis chapter 33. The story of Jacob, rightfully so, takes preeminence over his brother Esau because of Jacob's interaction with God. But there's an incredible bit of this story that's awfully easy to kind of skip over. As you do your daily Bible reading or as you read, it's awfully easy to skip over. And it's the story of Esau. And it's the story of how Esau, as Mark pointed out this morning, had been legitimately wronged. I mean, perhaps Esau should have had some more mental stuff going on to not let Jacob take advantage of him. But Esau was taken advantage of by his brother. His brother sold him out. And there was an incredible story and I think testimony of forgiveness here in Genesis chapter 33. Now you can imagine... And I almost did it, but I didn't. If I had a big stone, say a concrete block, a center block on stage, and I said, Jerry, I want you to come up here and I want you to hold this center block up as long as you can. How long do you think Jerry could hold that up? Now, he's strong, so don't offend him, right? How long could we hold up something that weighs as heavy as a big concrete block? 
Now, there's apparently there's contractors and stuff that do competitions with this, you know, in their downtime on their lunch break to see how long they can hold a block up. How long do you think a really strong man could hold a block up? Guess. 30 seconds. And that's Brother Ray, right? Now, he knows what a concrete block weighs. Can you imagine trying to hold something up that weighed so much? Just waist high. Can you feel the weight when you try to hold something up? Imagine trying to lug that thing around for a day or a week or a year. What would it be like to have to carry a concrete block with you everywhere you went for a year? What would that be like? Can you imagine? Esau did. I'm certain that Esau knew what that was like. His brother Jacob had not only cheated him once, he cheated him twice. They were twins. They were brothers. But Esau came out first, so he had all the rights, all the privileges of the firstborn. That is, until Jacob talked him into handing over what was, you can argue with this, but what was rightfully his. And Jacob outmaneuvers and manipulates him into turning over what was rightfully his in a very weak moment. At least Esau had to admit that he did actually agree to give over his birthright. He was hungry and he said to Jacob, look, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? But the second time, the second time, Jacob just cheated him. He put on a costume and he manipulated his dad. Now, I said this last week on Sunday morning, and I'm probably going to say it a lot. We have to understand it's such a good reminder for me. This really happened. These are real people. And you can imagine, for those of you out there that have sons, if one of your sons manipulated you into cheating the other son, how you would feel about that. And how the son who was cheated, how he would feel about that. This really happened. These are real people. Jacob just cheated his brother. Jacob dressed in his clothes, pretended like he was hairy. And he stole his blessing. And you got to understand, in the time that we're talking, this was a sacred thing. For a father to give a blessing to a son was a sacred thing. And when Esau and his father found out, they were both heartbroken. The text even says that Isaac trembled violently because he knew what he had done. Esau burst out, the text says, with a loud and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me, bless me too, my father. But Isaac couldn't do it. And we don't understand that because it's a cultural thing. But he had already given his blessing. He couldn't give another one. The best he could do was your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness. Not much of a blessing, right? You're going to live on the poor part of the land, right? You're going to live among the thorns. That's the best this father could come up with. But when you grow restless... As you live by the sword and serve your brother, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. That's not much of a blessing. And so it's no wonder how easy it would have been for Esau to have held a grudge against his brother. Now, I want to pinpoint us down tonight when we talk about forgiveness. I'm not talking about needing forgiveness for the stuff that we do that we shouldn't do. That's a good sermon, and we have preached on that. We'll preach on that in the future. I'm talking about how do we forgive when we've really been wronged? Should we forgive, and how should we forgive, and what does that look like when we have been legitimately wronged? Eventually, Jacob goes. Jacob causes some controversy where he goes to. Controversy seems to follow Jacob a little bit. So the Lord commands him, go back to the land of your fathers, to your relatives. To most people, that would sound like a simple request, but to Jacob, it's like a death sentence. Go back home? You mean go back home to the place where I cheated everybody? Go back home where my brother has vowed to kill me? How does Jacob feel about seeing Esau? Again, look at Genesis 33, verse 1. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold. Those behold moments are incredible, important moments. Esau 
was coming. What do you think Jacob was feeling? As he saw Esau, but not just Esau, the text says 400 men with him. Now, the time that we're talking about, 400 men is a lot of people. 400 men is a lot of men. Jacob looks and sees his brother Esau and the whole town coming toward him. What do you think Jacob's thinking? I cheated my brother. Legitimately, I lied. I'm guilty. Controversy has surrounded me. And here he comes. What do we expect Esau to do? Justice. Revenge. That's a very human emotion. It's a very human response. The last time that he saw his brother, Esau made it clear that he wanted his brother dead. And according to tradition, Esau had the right to take his life. At this time in human history, nobody would have blinked an eye. So he concocts a whole elaborate plan. Jacob does. Send a messenger to Esau saying he's coming, hoping to find favor in his eyes. He bring lots and lots of gifts. 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 30 donkeys. 550 animals, not counting the camels young. That's a lot of gifts. He even splits up his family and splits up his animals. And he kind of creates like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? And he marches on toward his brother, hoping that his brother is not going to fulfill what he said he would fulfill. And he prays fiercely. And this is when God shows up and this is when he wrestles. So we know a lot about what Jacob was thinking. But what was Esau thinking? Well, the text never spells it out. All we know is that he's had 20 years, give or take, to stew and to think about that concrete block that he's been carrying around. That anger, legitimate anger, righteous anger even, for what somebody else had wrongly done to him. When the messenger comes back from Esau, the news is ominous. The messenger tells Jacob, he's coming to meet you. I can't imagine what, it, what Jacob's thinking when the messenger just says, he's coming to meet you. Then the moment arrives. He can see Esau, 400 men behind him. Jacob puts the plan in action, splits them into groups. He bows down seven times as he comes closer and closer. And Jacob is praying for the Lord's protection. He's just been given this mighty promise, which is another sermon. The very next day, it seems, he's facing all of these warriors, hoping that his bribes are going to work. Put it another way, Jacob is fervently hoping that Esau has a heart of forgiveness. That's what he's hoping for. What's going on in Esau's mind? Has he already forgiven Jacob? If so, when did he do it? Why? Did he do it years earlier? Did he do it when he saw his brother's response to him? We don't know. Esau has reasons. This is what I want you to know, though. Esau has reasons. Human legitimate reasons to not forgive his brother. Just as you probably have reasons to hold on to pain and bitterness in your heart. As you look at people who have wronged you. It's easy to think of reasons, isn't it? To not forgive somebody. You can recount what they did over and over and over. You can be reminded perpetually of what they did to you that hurt you, how awful it was. Can you believe what they did? So what do we do with this? Because Esau forgives. He comes, verse 4, runs to meet him. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and 
they wept. One scholar said, what did that sound like when brothers are reunited in more ways than one? Verse 5, and when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servant drew near and the children and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob's trying to pay him back. And Esau says, no, I have enough. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a testimony that our world needs today. What in the world is going on in Esau's mind as he sees Jacob. Who do you need to forgive? Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. And I want to root this in this text, this narrative, okay? This story of Jacob and Esau. And keep in mind what you heard this morning and keep in mind this overall story of the two sons and betrayal and sin and the potential for anger and bitterness. Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not a compromise of morality. And forgiveness is not avoiding conflict. We sometimes fail in our understanding of forgiveness because we think, one, if we forgive that person, then somehow that means that we're going to sign off on what they did to us. And we're going to treat sin as if it were righteous. And that's not what forgiveness is. Not biblical forgiveness. God never turns a blind eye to those who compromise their morals. And God's justice ensures that those who do wrong will not get away with what they did wrong. We see over and over and over in the Old Testament that the murderer will pay a price, that the sex offender will pay a price, that those who sin will pay a price, that those who do legitimate wrong will pay a price, whether it's in this life or in the next, if those things are not redeemed. Forgiveness, you forgiving somebody else, doesn't mean that you're saying what they did was okay. Just like Esau doesn't wax over what Jacob did and say, you know what, Jacob, you had a reason to do what you did. You manipulated everybody and that's okay. That's not what he says because that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is also not just avoiding conflict and starting a cold war. You ever been in a relationship with somebody and what you say is forgiveness is just not talking for a while. That's not what forgiveness is either. Forgiveness isn't just avoiding the conflict and living in silence. Esau went to Jacob and faced him. And to Jacob's credit, although he had nothing else to do because God said that's what he was going to do, he went and he faced his brother. There are a lot of us that don't like conflict, right? Conflict's not easy. And it takes a special kind of personality to really, really like conflict. Nobody really, really likes conflict. But sometimes it's those moments where we endure that conflict and face that conflict and push through that conflict that real forgiveness takes root because we work through what needs to be worked through. Avoidance of conflict is not the same thing as forgiveness. So this is not what forgiveness is, okay? But let me tell you what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is release. Jesus alludes to this in Matthew chapter 18. Forgiveness is throwing that stone away. To forgive means that you release the other party of something that you've been holding on to. Something that you've placed in your debt on their behalf. Forgiveness is not calling immorality okay. It's not turning a blind eye to injustice. Forgiveness simply means that you choose to release somebody from their personal obligation to you. Even though that person may face consequences from their action. One of my favorite stories about the Civil War 
I guess, post-Civil War, as the war was starting to wind down and the Union, it was all but guaranteed that the North was going to defeat the Confederacy. And right on the Mason-Dixon line, Abraham Lincoln was taking a tour of some plantations. And there was a tree on a plantation outside of Nashville, Tennessee that had housed Confederate soldiers where sons of the Confederacy had fought and died. Mothers had lost sons. There was this great big old tree. And it had been all but obliterated. There were fire marks and bullet holes. And the person who owned the plantation was showing President Lincoln around. And President Lincoln said, what's the story on that tree? And the landowner told President Lincoln about the battles that had been fought there and, and what had happened. And the tree was in the midst of that. And that landowner looked at President Lincoln and said, I will never cut that tree down because it will always remind me of how bad this war was and the price that was paid and the sons that were lost. And quick, as quick as they say, historians say, quick-witted as Abraham Lincoln was, he looked at that man square in the face and he said, if I could offer you one piece of advice, sir, it would be cut that tree down because you'll never move on in your life until you do. As long as that tree stands, you will be reminded continually of who hurt you and you'll never move on. Cut the tree down. Forgiveness is release. And somewhere along the way, Esau had decided that he was going to forgive his brother. And he had cut that birthright, that tree called birthright, he had cut it down. Forgiveness is release. Forgiveness is also the application of grace and truth. Jesus is the perfect embodiment of both. How can people in an Amish community start to talk about forgiveness within 24 hours after a murderer shot their children down? Is it that they didn't care about their children? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. How can Esau forgive a brother who wronged him to the core? Is it because he didn't care about himself or because he didn't care about what Jacob had done? Absolutely not. But see, when you are rooted in grace and when you are rooted in the truth of God, when a tornado of evil rips your life apart, you know that you can still stand because God is your strength, not what was taken from you. A knowledge that God is still there even when tragedy strikes. A knowledge of the community that surrounds you even when bad things happen. A continual reminder of how loved you are, even in the bad circumstances of life. And a reminder of how much you need the Lord yourself. Grace and truth. I need it. And when I understand that I need grace and truth, then it's easier for me to dispense grace and truth. And here may be one of my favorites. What forgiveness is. Forgiveness is a new way of looking at other people. It is choosing to see people differently than the normal person sees somebody else. It is a radical, life altering, countercultural perspective on life. Esau had made the choice at some point in his life, at some point over the last 20 or so odd years, to not see Jacob for what he did, but see Jacob for what he could be. That's forgiveness. And so I don't see somebody as the person who did what they did, but I see that person as an image bearer of God who can turn around and make better choices. Forgiveness means looking at people who have really wronged you and deciding that even though you would, you would love to set things right, judge not that you be not judged. Forgiveness is a decision, but it's also a process. It's something you decide to do, but it's also something that takes time. You've got to be patient with it. You still have to deal with emotions, raw, hurt feelings for days and weeks and even years 
at a time. Forgiveness is a decision that you make, but it's also a process. So how does forgiveness work? Maybe you say, you know what? I want to be a more forgiving person. I want to read one text with you from the Old Testament. The 32nd Psalm says this, verse 1, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. To be forgiven. To be forgiven. Is to be blessed beyond your wildest dreams. We've talked all night about. Those people who have legitimately wronged you. But I want you to think in your mind. Is there a time. Or is there a person. That you have legitimately wronged. And to be forgiven of that. Both by that person and by God. When you have been guilty. Is to be blessed beyond your wildest dreams. That's what the psalmist says in the 32nd Psalm. God is willing to forgive your mistakes and offenses. God is willing to wipe your record clean. No debt is owed. The account is settled. How do you do it? You acknowledge it. You acknowledge it. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. The psalmist goes on to say, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What does Paul say about us? All of us need the Lord. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God looks at each and every one of us and says, all you have to do, all you have to do is acknowledge and confess and blessing comes and forgiveness comes. And I will fill you. So how do we forgive others? We take a page from God's book. Forgiveness takes a strong person. It takes a strong person, especially when you've been wrong. But here's what I want to leave you with. For those people in your life who have legitimately wronged you, those situations where you've been hurt and you've been trampled on and your heart was broken, if those people come and confess and seek to make those things right, be like your father. And if they don't, in as much as you can, be like your father. Many times they don't, do they? Many times they don't. But perhaps in 20 years, they will want to meet you on the road. Be like your father. Folks, Esau could have killed his brother and nobody would have blinked an eye. And this is before the vast majority of the written code was encoded. It's the Wild West. And Esau says, I'm going to forgive. If for no other reason than because I want to be like God, I'm going to forgive. If for no other reason than I want to throw that concrete block off of my plate so I can live free, I want to be like my father. I don't know how many of you are carrying a concrete block around. But can I be real practical? It's not the best way to live, is it? It's not the most efficient way to live. This world needs to see forgiveness. Even when forgiveness is hard. What would the world see if they saw that within the church? The liberating power of forgiveness. Let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful for every opportunity that you have given us 
Father, we're grateful for the beginnings of the nation of Israel and already the lessons that we see that are so closely associated with those of us who have faith in your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless this lesson to us tonight. Father, we have at different points in time been wronged, and you know that, legitimately hurt. Father, I pray for us that you would help us to work through those experiences effectively. That through your spirit, you would begin to empower us and continue to work in us to bring about health emotionally and psychologically. Help us be like you. And for once, Father, within this specific context, we pray that we would be like Esau. We need your help because it's hard to do and it is easy to allow bitterness to reign supreme. So we willingly cry out to you and say, we need you. We need your help. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we offer you the opportunity to respond in some way. Maybe you think about the people that you need to forgive and you want to ask the church to help you do that through prayer and encouragement. We stand absolutely ready to do that at any time. This is a place of peace, not a place of judgment. Maybe you've wronged somebody else and you want to make that right. Maybe you need to do that publicly. Maybe you can take care of that one-on-one and we would encourage you to do it that way. But maybe you need to take care of it publicly and we're happy to to pray for those things and and to, to help make those things right. Maybe you're not a believer and so not a lot of this makes sense because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Why not make that right tonight? Uh, He stands ready to accept you if you'll confess his name and be immersed tonight. Uh, If we can help you in any way, let us know what we can do while together we stand and while we sing.